Greetings, friends. I am Matthew Kennedy, licensed professional counselor. You are listening to Experience Emerge. Today, we will dive into another conversation about the broken and fractured aspects of our lives. Then we will discuss how we put these pieces back together again to find rest and live free. C.S. Lewis once said, Miracles are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. In today's episode, we are going to explore a story in hopes to gain a little bit of perspective on those larger letters. Well, welcome to the third episode of XM, or Experience Emerge. Yesterday, we recorded this episode at the studio um, at the counseling center where I work. Today, I'm working from home for the foreseeable future. So if you hear some strange noises in the background, it is probably my two-year-old daughter running around upstairs or my wife running after her. Uh, We are living in some strange times. I know I've never experienced anything like this in my life. We've been asked to be socially distant. In today's episode, we are taught that connectivity is what helps us overcome the trauma and wounds in our life. That suddenly gets a lot harder in times like these. Today, our guest is a colleague of mine and happens to be the trauma team leader at uh, Emerge Counseling Ministries. I believe she started with Emerge about 16 years ago. She's done a tremendous job along with the rest of the team, equipping us to be trauma-informed. She's spoke at a lot of seminars, done a lot of public speaking around this topic that we are going to tackle today. Today, our guest is someone I look up to as a mentor and a leader. She is a licensed professional clinical counselor and supervisor. Please welcome Victoria Gutbrood. I really care and have a heartbeat for helping individuals understand trauma, the impact that it has on the mind, body, and the spirit, and helping individuals with a Christian biblical background integrate some of the most cutting-edge therapies, interventions, and techniques that are out there so that we are not afraid of them, so that we can integrate them into our counseling practices. So I'm really proud of the fact that um, I have a little bit of a science mind and I'm a, a geek mind, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I have this uh, um, ability to love scripture and love God. And whenever I'm in a training or whenever I'm learning something new, my brain is capable of kind of integrating those two. And so that's been a big part of what I've brought here to Emerge and what I've done mm-hmm. in building the trauma team and some of the work I've done with my clients over the last 14 years in this environment. Good. Tell me a little bit uh, about your training, a little bit about, um, you know, your background in, in getting to understand what trauma is. So I came into counseling later in my life. I had already had a career in development and fundraising, and I went back to school in my 30s. And when I was working at Parmadale in residential, I happened to get invited to see Bessel van der Kolk mm-hmm. at one of his earlier speaking engagements. And anyone who knows anything about trauma knows about Bessel. What's interesting is there was only 40 people in the room at this time. So he was just early in making his rounds. And when he spoke about the things he spoke about, my brain just lit up. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, I've been taking the theories and that scientific understanding and knowledge of um, ther- of trauma and Im- applying it into the Christian realm. Mm-hmm. And so, so much of my training over the years has been under some of the great names. So I've trained and gone to um, w- continuing education with SCARE. Um, I've been to see Peter Levine. I've, um, you know, participated in some of the big names, seen Bessel three times. Um, because it's really important for me. I've, I've probably logged half of my CEUs over the last decade, seeing some of the really important trauma theorists. And I've also invested in getting certified in EMDR. And so EMDR is one of the techniques that I will use. And it's important to know that I've invested the time to be what they consider in the field an expert. Um, and that's hard to say, but yeah. I cared about it. I cared enough to go the extra mile. Yeah. So for those of us who are listening who are not therapists, Bessel wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score, 
which is um, just a really, really great book about really yeah. understanding trauma. You'd mentioned CEUs, and that's something that as therapists we have to continue getting our education, um, and it's something that we have to get so many uh, every two years to, to keep up. Um, talk to me a little bit about then your definition of trauma. What, what, how do we define this word that we're utilizing so much? This um, definition comes from a culmination of some of the definitions I've read about, as well as the clients that have sat in my office that I've experienced and that I learned from. And so I feel like they um, collectively wrote this. Mm. It's an event or series of events that activates the body, the brain, and the soul of a person to survive whatever experiences before them. If the individual support system or environment does not provide safety after the event or events, their body, brain, and soul won't be able to return to a state of balance. Therefore, the survival state remains activated and the body, brain, and soul are rewired to protect the self in all experiences deemed threatening or vulnerable in everyday life. True self, um, soul self, can become fractured, lost, and more protective and primal states of your system will lead. Mm, that's really good. So maybe in your own words, just kind of give us an idea of what that looks like and what does that exactly mean? So without having visuals and being audio, it's kind of difficult to explain the brain. But what I will say is it's it's about recognizing that we are triune beings, yeah, mm-hmm. and we were created mind, body, and with a spirit. And so God didn't make a mistake when he created our brain and our body to function in harmony and in balance. The word for it in science is homeostasis. And so oftentimes when we are in a state of homeostasis, we are the most productive and we are in the now, we are mindful, we are fully present. Um, I like to oftentimes talk about how Jesus was a master at being in homeostasis, so much Mm -hmm. so that when someone would touch him, he could feel the power of their touch, Mm -hmm. um, as with the woman who was touching his robe. And so I think it's really powerful to remember that is the state we crave. However, when we become activated because something in front of us is um, a state of emergency, kind of like what we're in right now with the health crisis, Mm -hmm. what it does is it activates us to be in more of a primal state, a fight, flee, shut down state. That's more in our limbic system. Um, And the purpose of that is for survival, survival of the system at all costs in the now. So it rapidly will think about past or it will project um, possibilities into the future, but it's very hypervigilant, it's very manic, it's very rapid, it's very verbal, um, and it's constantly recognizing and thinking about. It's that internal voice that's thinking about whatever is the threat that's lying ahead of me. And so I do a lot of trainings on trauma, and what I teach individuals is what you may think is threatening is may not be threatening to a person who, let's say, is a trauma survivor, or what you may think is non-threatening could be threatening to them. I work a lot with the women at rehab, and I teach staff a lot about just meals. And sometimes they can just get triggered by certain ways that um, individuals sit around a table. Mm-hmm. They, You wouldn't have thought that, but if their family had high violence around a table, um, it could be really triggering to actually just be sitting at a table having a meal when they haven't done that in a really long time. Sure. And so recognizing there's these state of survivals that we are in. We can also be in our brain stem. Our brain stem really doesn't have a lot of language to it. It's more the numbing out. Um, it's more the dissociative. It's more the shutting down. Um, so that's a different state. But again, it's in the more primal part of the brain. And so then we move into the cortex, the neocortex, the higher regions of the brain. And those parts of the brain literally under trauma are less active and more difficult to access. And so because of that, we don't have access to our right hemisphere, our left hemisphere. We don't have what we call bilateral communication, crossing midline. We also don't have access to frontal lobe. And in frontal lobe, we have all these executive functioning skills one of them being empathy. Um, So I was recently down in Florida with a crisis team ministering to individuals coming off of 
Hurricane Michael Mm -hmm. and um, the disaster from that. And one of the things I noticed is how there was lack of eye contact happening. And that's because when we are in a state of survival, we have lost the ability to look into someone's eyes to Mm -hmm. connect. And without that, um, we can't engage in empathy. And that can be a source of survival if you are in an extreme situation. But it can also separate us from humanity and separate us from even ourselves when we're not able to see others. Mm. And so those are really important things to think about is that the the trauma brain, it's not that it 100% always lives in the limbic system and the brainstem, it's easily activated and it's that is becoming the primary way in which we are filtering data versus only being used in extreme situations. Mm -hmm. A great example of this is I was in a car accident about two years ago, and I remember being in the car accident, and I remember getting kind of shook up from it and going through the process of reprocessing it, and I had to drive by that incident um, for you know the, the, a year afterwards, because it was a detour when we had all that construction happening in um, here in Akron, and I remember having to drive by that site and having to release my body, having to reset my nervous system, and having to say all the time that happened, but it's not happening now. Mm. That happened, but it's not happening now because my brain lost the ability to recognize that that was no longer happening. And so I would feel my heart rate. Um, I had accidentally um, run a red light. And so I literally kept thinking I forgot how to read a light. And so I kept having to say, okay, it's a red light. Red light means stop. Green light means go. And it's so basic. But remember, I didn't have access to um, those more higher regions of my brain. And it, it probably took about two months before my brain could fully reset and I could drive by that area. I did some EMDR around it. I did some of the other techniques, some somatic work, and I was able to reset. Now I don't think about that accident anymore. Um, So that's just a perfect example of in the moment my survival system worked. I literally shut down. I had very little memory of the incident. Um, It was a pretty significant incident. So had I been seriously injured, my body was numbed. I was detached from myself. I was separate. My my brain and my body were separate, which was all um, natural and um, necessary. Mm. Well, I'm so thankful that you're okay. <laughs> um, you had mentioned Rahab. I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the population that you work with and, and, and what that looks like and some of the experiences maybe that you've had um, in, in your time at Emerge. Yeah, God has a great sense of humor because... Uh, I never set out in my career to work with trauma. That's not necessarily um, some special calling that I felt like I had. It was one of those things that God just opened the door for me. It started with um, working with the adolescent, high-risk adolescent population at Parmadale and being able to see through my eyes some of the therapies we were doing just wasn't working. Um, But I couldn't at that point articulate it. I didn't understand. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so then when I got introduced to Bessel and, and all that he talked about, it was so easy for me to make the translation and say, wow, this is what was missing. And so then as I moved into um, the latter stage of my career and I transitioned to Akron and I became a therapist here at Emerge, um, we went through our own crisis in my family. My husband's a trauma survivor and he had at that point a reactivation of his PTSD. And so at that point, I started looking for really good trauma therapists and I was pretty amazed to find out that there was only two people in this region who were um, practicing EMDR. I was able to get my husband, uh, we were able to get in for him to see this person, and it was fascinating how it shifted him, and it was fascinating what it did. And so then I became intrigued by it and did some of my own work with um, this individual, and it became this understanding of I can't do other types of therapies when I know this now. And so then I began to practice it personally here. I invested in getting trained 
and went through that process and began working on it with clients. And I've always been naturally uh, um, skilled at gestalt and here and now and body work. Mm -hmm. And so I was easily able to, with some of the trainings and backgrounds that I was already um, somewhat um, called towards, I was able to integrate those really well um, and so begin to use some of the somatic work as well as healing prayer. So healing prayer um, as well as EMDR, kind of all, we call it the inner weave. Mm -hmm. We use them all together um, collectively or sometimes separate in their true forms depending upon what the client needs. So I primarily now, 14 years later, work with trauma victims, individuals who have had chronic, um, complex PTSD, um, who've been through multiple different types of therapies and who are looking for something different. And so I, you know, out of all that burst, this um, specialty and this passion that really just started with um, these small little steps along the way. Mm. So uh, you were talking a little bit, and, and when we were doing the pre-interview, you had a conversation with me about Adam and Eve <clears throat> And trauma. I'd love for you to be able to share a little bit of your perspective of the, um, you know, the, the, the beginning of creation and, and where you kind of see how trauma r relates to that uh, time. I remember in one of my um, prayer times with the Lord, just sitting and meditating with him and just asking him to show me um, how scripture and how his word um, speaks to trauma. He took me back to the garden and he took me back to um, the beginning and how his intent was for Adam and Eve to live in harmony, homeostasis and balance. And yet um, when um, sin entered and they um, engaged in um, that act, um, it separated them and it separated them and because of that they experienced this huge trauma and that trauma for them was the separation um, not only from themselves um, from their creator but also from one another as well as the safety of the world that they were in and so you have to kind of think that what was once safe for them is no longer safe and by no means do I believe that Adam and Eve like that we in this current world um, always like our sin doesn't always create trauma sometimes it's other individual sins who will impose trauma on us so um, if you are an abuse survivor someone else's sin had a direct impact on your ability to connect first with yourself then with God and all these other aspects of your life and so it kind of has a trickle-down effect share with us a little bit about um, the self and and what that means to you mm -hmm. Yeah, let me start with the wound itself. I mean, the wound itself is a part of us that gets left behind or broken off or held captive by the enemy. In the beginning, it was really mercy and grace, whatever system inside of us. So if you go back to what I was talking about in the limbic system and in the brainstem, whatever system took over to protect us, that was natural, that was normal, that was grace and mercy. God gave us those abilities to survive um, because those around us weren't able to protect us. And so what happens is those individuals or those parts of us, they get trapped back in those spaces. So intellectually, developmentally, chronologically, circumstantially, we mature, we develop. But socially and emotionally, we stay trapped in those places of where those traumas originated from. And so those are the wounded parts of us. And so you see this a lot in a lot of um, psychology and even in a lot of um, Christian psychologists write about this, the wound itself. It's not an unknown concept. Mm -hmm. And so what we do often in the types of therapies that I practice is we spend a lot of time first befriending or getting to know the parts of us that are protecting those um, those wounded or more, more vulnerable parts, um, those more exiled parts, those parts that we have cast off because we found that our system couldn't handle it um, or the belief system that our system couldn't handle it. And so as we mature and we grow, we will find that whenever we are activated with a situation that reminds us of that trauma, so go back to my definition, activated, 
reminds us of our trauma, we will regress to mm. um, emotionally and socially that age level. It's as if our brain has forgotten that we are 50. Um, mm-hmm. So my brain is saying, oh, when I was seven and I was in, when I was five and I was in a really bad accident and I was hospitalized and I felt rejected, any single time I feel alone, I'm being rejected. But in reality, um, I'm a um, 50-year-old woman who is fully capable of recognizing that the circumstances around me are not as such. But if I'm activated and I haven't healed that deep wound of when I was hospitalized, hospitalized and left in the hospital um, for days um, because of other circumstances in my family, I would think that I was unlovable and not worthy and not enough. And so it's really important to recognize that we have to kind of go back um, to those wounded spaces to help them come forward. And we can't do that without um, our nervous system or those protectors giving us access to that. And the enemy takes this. He takes what was once so natural and he makes it um, unnatural. He he whispers lies into those parts of us and he tells us things like, um, you are not enough. You can't do this. You can't handle this. Mm-hmm. Um, this is too much for you. People are bad. You're bad. Whatever those lies are, value statements, the world isn't safe. You're not safe. And so he takes those and he enslaves us with them. And this is where the beauty of Jesus comes in because um, the grace and the and the goodness and the kindness of God brought to us this this. Um, man who literally came to set us free, who literally died for us. He literally died so that those um, parts of us that are enslaved or held back or um, fear-driven can be integrated, can be fully set free, can be realized and integrated into the true parts of who we are. And so I love how beautiful that is. Um, I will tell one of my own personal experiences with that is when I went back and found that little girl in her hospital bed, right? Mm. She was five and she was in a body cast and um, she was in a, um, this is 1975, so she's in a ward with a whole hospital ward with a whole bunch of other children. And one of the things I failed to see until I could go back there with Jesus' eyes was how playful I was and how fun I was and how much I loved all the little kids around me. And we played puppets and we did all this fun stuff. And I had almost forgotten that playful side of me in stress and the ability for me to move and dance. And so what's so funny is I've done so much of my own healing and integration It's really birthed back in me, and I think anyone who spends any time with me can see that playfulness Mm -hmm. and can see that creativity because prior to being able to go back and have that integration, it was so separate from who I was, Um, you know, that loss of that inner child. And when we don't have that integration of whatever parts are kind of held in captivity, held in our mind, we don't have access to these really rich parts of who we are, Um, you know. And so often Jesus talks about um, the faith of our, our the children, and all of us have an inner child inside of us mm-hmm. who has this amazing ability to um, connect with God. Yeah, it's it's such a thank you for sharing that story and, and being so open with that, and um, being able to hear the freedom of being captive, and then allowing um, that that captivity part of ourselves to be set free. And that's the whole point of this whole Mm -hmm. journey. Um, You and I talked about maybe just kind of describing um, uh, an exercise that if, if, if somebody's listening to this and they're going, yeah, that's I'm the trauma brain. That's what I'm experiencing. What might be something that we could share with them that they might be able to do like even right now? Um, to relieve themselves a little bit of, of, of that trauma? What would be something that we could um, share mm. with them? Two things I 
always teach clients is about how to help your brain and your body kind of reconnect. And in order to return to that state of homeostasis, we have to first kind of discharge the energy so that we can release whatever's being pent up inside of us. And then we have to move to some type of mindfulness activity. So I'm going to just teach you the Yahweh breath. It's one of my favorite. Um, So I'm not uh, going to go into the whole... uh, theological background of um, what this is intended, but the way Yahweh was originally written, it was meant to be breathed. It was not meant to just be spoken, and it is Mm. the breath of life. It is the very breath of life. So let's imagine you're having a really stressful day, um, and you do a really good shakeout. So I just want everybody (laughs) who's listening to me right now, and again, if you know anything about me, you're going to know I'm going to get you to move your body and do something awkward. So I just want you to, you know, shake it out and move around and do the wiggles, Yeah, and just get yourself, because it's hard to get into a state of um, balance if you Mm -hmm. haven't first released tension. Yeah, okay. And so now um, I'm going to model for you what it looks like, and then let's all kind of do it together. So the first way is you're literally breathing in and out the word Yahweh. So it will sound like this. Okay, so the breath in is ya, and the breath out is way, and you're trying to keep your mouth open, and you're not shutting your lips, okay? And let's do it for a series of three, because the Trinity just rocks, <laughs> and I love the Trinity, and so I, like I love that. all things three. Okay. So let's do that together and ending. One, two, three. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's good. Yeah. I feel good. I know, right? You're so here. You're so now. <laughs> I am very present. Mm-hmm. Well, Victoria, I, I appreciate you very much. And, um, you know, I, I just think there. this is just a very strange time that we're living in. Yeah. And I think that this message was very timely and understanding a little bit more about trauma, what that means, what that looks like. Um I thank you for your time and and your uh, willingness to come and and, and share this information. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we go? Yeah, I want to share a little bit about a recent um, time that I spent with a a team of individuals down in Florida. And we were ministering to individuals in the Panama City region. And when we got down there, it was really hard for us to comprehend the breadth of what they all had gone through in the course of um, the impact of the hurricane that had come through in October of 2018. And so they were still 15 months out of the hurricane. And one of the things I saw was that there was such lack of eye contact um, and everyone was kind of just existing within themselves. And even so much that Pamela and Dr. Crosby noticed it when they were speaking at the church. And so what I think is super important, and I spoke about it with the individuals there and I helped individuals recognize that, but I see it in our world right now. I see that there's lack of eye contact because everyone is kind of afraid they're turning inward and these parts of them that are surviving are coming forward. And it's okay, you know, to some degree. And it's really hard when you're in a survival state, remember, to filter what's true and what's not, because you don't have access to those parts of your brain that help you filter that out. And so it's really important to get out of being activated um, and get into a state of homeostasis, of rational thinking, of full brain thinking. And so I think the first thing we can do is look at each other. Um, Look at the person in the store next to us. Um, Look at the people when we are out in public. Um, I think it's important, um, especially when we resume being back out in public. Probably by the time this will be released, we will be. And so uh, make sure you look and, and smile and connect. Have empathy. I think the humanity of it, that's what Jesus would do. He would look at you. He would be with you. And I think the other important thing is to recognize this activates us all because we all have some type of history. And so just being able to let our stories unfold and inviting Jesus into it and inviting him into the space that is not unknown to him. And so that we can walk in truth and we can walk in dignity and strength 
and not be afraid of the future, right? You know, laugh, laugh instead of fear. It's um, Proverbs mm. um, 31 talks about. And so I just, I really end with that. Um, I really end just praying that we continue to um, connect, make eye contact, and care about one another. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really proud of the team of therapists that I work with because I know they're providing excellent care and we're making sure that we can meet the needs of all of our clients while they are in this crisis. And so I'm just um, grateful for that. Yeah, thank you for that word. In this time right now where we're almost forced to being uh, disconnected, there's going to be a time when we move through this and we need to reconnect. Mm-hmm. Victoria, thank you so much for this time, and, and uh, God bless you. Thank you. You're God right. bless you, too. Well, we really do want to thank Victoria for sharing her expertise and knowledge of trauma, also her faith and her deep connection with the Lord. You know, each day we keep getting new information in the landscape of our country and the issues around the world change by the minute. Uh, we at XM are praying for you and your families Please go to Emerge.org for more information on what we do as a counseling center. Many of us uh, therapists are continuing therapy from our homes using telehealth. Also, please share this podcast with your friends and family. So until next time, or when our Savior comes, God bless.